All right, welcome to our webinar. We hope you've made it uh, online. I know that we kind of changed dates and times on you a little bit, but we're excited to have you here with us. And I know a lot of you are getting back to practicing dentistry daily, which is awesome. So we're excited to give you this webinar. The topic for today is gonna be immediate placement and immediate load. Um, again, if you are new to our webinar platform as a um, form of introduction, there is a question and answer area. That question and answer area um, is gonna be available for you to type any questions and we'll try to answer those at the end. Um, so just find that at the top there. Everyone is muted, so if you are trying to talk through it, it's not actually gonna come through. So welcome to our webinar. Happy to have you here. We have got an exciting topic. Um, what has your experience been, Dad, with this? You've been doing implants a long time, immediate placement, immediate loads, kind of a fun, somewhat newer topic, if you will, but what's it been like for you? You know, I started doing implants about 31 years ago. And about five years into it, I and others started asking questions. We just took out this tooth. Why can't we just put an implant in? And everyone said, you can't do that. And I said, why? It takes enormous amount of cellular communication of our body to heal that site. Why wouldn't we want to just put an implant into that site, make it primarily stable, do a little bone grafting to make up for the uh, anatomical disparity between the extraction site and the implant. And that's what we did. And lo and behold, in the closet, unbeknownst to anybody, I and others were just pushing that envelope. And then out of the blue, it became acceptable. So here we are 25 years later talking about the same thing. We've come a long ways. And then this immediate load thing is, is kind of uh, uh, scary to people. When they talk about immediate load, be clear, we're not talking about immediate occlusal load. We're talking about an immediate masticatory load of food bolus. So uh, I had the privilege 10, 11 years ago to do a research project for Nobel. And for, uh, I placed 80 implants, uh, two, three other clinicians placed 40 to 80. We, we immediately loaded every one of them. And at the end of the day, we lost four. And so I became a big fan of immediate load on a single implant. And I actually have better, stronger convictions of the outcome on multiple implants because of cross arch stability and splinting and all of that. So this topic today of immediate placement, immediate loads, exciting. It's what you all want to know how to do, and I get it, but you have to also know the rules. There are some very definitive rules. We haven't copied anybody today. We're giving you everything we've got as far as it relates to pearls. A pearl to me is something important that you can take to your clinic and use tomorrow. Uh, we're giving you some great things to think about, and we're appreciative of you being here. Uh, we hope you're all well. It's been a tough go for everybody, but it looks like we're starting to get back into things. So let's, uh, let's go for it, Riley. Here we go. Awesome. Well, welcome again. We're excited to have everyone. I see more and more joining in by the minute, and so we're excited to have you here uh, for our webinar. Let's talk about immediate placement and a couple of factors to consider. There are a lot of factors to consider. I'm gonna go through this list and we'll share a few thoughts and then we'll share kind of some overwhelming kind of broad topic things. But I think the first thing to consider is patient expectations. Um, immediate placement is awesome for the patient because they get the ability to get their surgery done all at once. And so that is a great thing, but you wanna make sure they understand the risk that they are potentially taking um, by doing it at the same time. I was surprised to find a lot of clinicians are actually not doing this. My practice up in Oregon, um, there's a lot of doctors up there that don't do immediate placement just because no one out there is really pushing the envelope with that. But making sure the patient understands what's involved, I think, is really important. One thing that you need to be clear on, when you talk to a patient about an immediate placement, you must, in my opinion, talk to them about the added... Um, potential of some problems. If you don't, and there are problems, then you're going to be indicted by not telling the whole story. 
Sometimes I also feel compelled to do that immediate load when interoperatively it doesn't feel good. It doesn't, it's not right. So always give yourself an out. Tell the patient, I believe this can be an immediate load. However, please cut me some slack. If this doesn't feel clinically right to my clinical judgment, I will not do it. And I need you to be able to accept that. And I think that's kind of a little bit of a head start in dialoguing with your patients as to their expectations and the clinical outcome uh, sequela that can occur, good or bad, because of, them, of that choice. The second one is tooth number. So what region in the mouth you're working on? This might be um, one of the biggest, I think, things to consider. Certainly, we're going to look at a lateral incisor, very different than a maxillary molar, and we'll talk more about that a little bit. Bone health, bone anatomy. The anatomy dictates everything. That's going to tell us what there is to work with when the tooth is out of there and what the anatomy currently looks like. A couple of others, primary stability potential. I ideally want every implant that goes in to have some primary stability. Yes, blood is the magic, but we do know with good primary stability, it's probably going to heal a little faster and mitigate um, potential for risk of not healing properly. We need to look at the soft tissue, the health and the anatomy. What does it look like? Um, informed consent, we talked about that a little bit, and then health history. Like always, when we're doing surgical procedures and multiple components of a surgery, we need to make sure that the health profile of the patient really match up with everything. And I wouldn't push the envelope on a patient that's got autoimmune disease. I wouldn't push the envelope on a smoker. And then I wouldn't push the envelope on, on people that just bother you. Some people intimidate you. They come in and push you. If you feel like this is adding up, or maybe they're parafunctional habits, their teeth are all ground down halfway into the, into the dentin, uh, that's probably a big red flag. Don't load this, immediate load. This would be a bad idea. I, I think it's a horrible idea to load something immediately uh, you know, as you get posterior in the mouth, uh, those forces are enormous. And the closer to the TMJ, the, the, the higher the risk. And uh, I would be very hesitant to do this in D3 bone, D4 bone, heaven forbid, don't do that. You're gonna get in trouble. So when we talk about immediate placement, there's three big, big things that are on our radar. We wanna share those with you right here. And I, I boiled it down to, uh, you know, what, what's really important for you as clinicians? Number one, do not expect to put in a dental implant immediately if it's not an atraumatic extraction. This is a art. We were all duped in dental school. We were taught to take a forcep, grab that tooth and push buckly. Oh my gosh, that just, that, that, that horrifies me today. There are atraumatic extraction techniques that all of us should be doing if we're going to be an implantologist and expect to have the periodontion in any uh, condition worthy of, of an implant placed immediately. So that atraumatic extraction is super important. Number two, biotype. If you have a biotype that's wimpy, it's translucent, you can look through it, transparent, it's, it's, it doesn't have a lot of uh, keratinized attachment. That's a big red flag. Be, be very biotype savvy in, in your uh, assessment of these cases. And lastly, uh, as I boil it down to the three big three is pathology free. Now, if a tooth breaks off at the gum line, it has a, maybe a post uh, endo, but there's no pathology, pathology apically that might be a really good uh, opportunity to uh, utilize this immediate placement and possibly immediate load. But these are the top three. So let's talk for a minute about the extraction cycle. I've thought a lot about this. If you do what you've always done, you will get what you've always got. And that, uh, that applies to anything in life. Let's, let's make it applicable to extractions. If you just take a forcep, with your working hand and you're holding a mirror, you already started the extraction wrong. Put the mirror down, put your non-working hand over the buccal plate and the lingual or palatal plate, and then take your elevator and insert it at a perfect angle 
into the interceptal bone, never touching the opposing arch. So the, the uh, atraumatic extraction is a, is a formula of, of the three things call it whatever you may, but you have an elevating component, you have a forcep component, and you've got a periatome or a power tome or some aspect of, of working periodontal ligament spaces. I believe that the problem is, is we do this same thing over and over again for, for a half an hour, 40 minutes. That's nuts. Don't do that. If after five minutes you have elevated, used a forcep, periatomed, go back to elevation, back to periatome, back to elevation, try forcep, then back to elevation. Do you get the program? You're just going back and forth. Maybe elevate on the buckle, uh, the mesial from a buckle aspect. Maybe uh, elevate from the distal on the lingual aspect. Work it all around. You've got a bunch of choices there. Then go ahead and use a periatome. Periatomes are really nice, work the PDL, sometimes use a mallet and pound it down into the periodontal ligament space, then use a forcep, but never take a forcep and pull buccally and lingually stretching, straining, hurting the bone. I think that we need to take the tooth out the way it was expected, just straight out. Okay, but that non-working hand is magical for me. I pass it on. If you're not doing that, you'll feel so much more comfortable and confident tomorrow doing that technique. But after five minutes, maybe seven, maybe two, whatever your magic number is, for me it's about two and a half minutes, then I don't continue to do what I'm always doing, expecting to get something different. I'm not gonna get anything different. Then section the two. Now, some of you are saying, well, I would never section only a molar. Well, I don't think you're thinking it right section a one-rooted tooth. Which direction are you gonna section it? You're gonna section it in most always except a bifurcated pre, buckle to lingual, why? So when you elevate that, you're elevating it into the interceptal bone of the neighbor, not the precious sacred buccal plate. Okay, do you follow? So what are you doing when you're elevating? You're taking the elevator and putting it into the interceptal bone and trying to make space. Well, the reality is you're making space by stretching the bone somewhere else, circumferentially around where that tooth is. By sectioning a one-rooted tooth with a 557 long shank surgical burr, lots of water, you can do a beautiful job. Be careful of the buccal plate. Be careful to not swing it so it doesn't get outside the tooth and then take a 301 elevator, hold it buccally, lingually, and then just separate it, and then take a piece out, and then you'll be able to get the other piece out. But this is a full day lecture, but I'm telling you that sectioning the tooth after five minutes of trying the, the, the standard protocol of the uh, components of the extraction circle allow you to you know, uh, alleviate a lot of heartache and an atraumatic extraction can follow. If after sectioning the tooth, you're elevating, you're using your forceps or your periatome or whatever, and I'm not talking about uh, sectioning the tooth from the crown down. At this point, if you have to section the tooth, cut it off right above the papillas. And some of you are going, shoot, dang. Hey, just cut off the handle. No, you just optimize physics. So cut it off, then section it, and then you've really, don't try to section through the clinical crown, that's nuts. It, it's too tall, it binds on your burr, it doesn't do you any good. So cut it off above the papillas, then section the tooth. And again, I like sectioning it buckle to lingual without getting through the tooth, but let it pop as you, as you elevate it. So once you've sectioned the tooth, then go through the, the three things, the elevation, the forceps may not be uh, viable. I can get a pair of uh, Ron Gears usually in on a root. Um, and the periatome may be very helpful at this point. After five minutes of that, then reflect a flap. And the reflecting the flap gives you better visibility. It might be reflecting the flap first and then sectioning the tooth uh, five minutes later. You'll have to decide clinically. There's just different scenarios that would dictate one direction or the other. That is the, the atraumatic extraction that I've come to love. I, I really, I take out all my teeth with Ron Gears. They're dull, I have a good grip on the tooth. 
I like a good 301 and a 302. I like the 557 or a, a 169 surgical length burr. Um, it's all about not being traumatic. Years ago, when I was taught in dental school, we just cut the bone, made a space, and then elevated. That makes no sense to me. If you need to make space, cut the tooth. Make a little trough so you can get an elevator in there and get true physics going. By cutting the clinical crown off, you'll find enormous uh, benefits. By using your non-working hand, feeling the buccal plate, you'll feel a lot of good things there. After reflecting the flap and five minutes, you can't, then there's a term here in Heber City where we live and it's get her done. It's a little bit of a redneck term. If you look it up, it's a redneck term used to prod a fellow to complete a task. So I would just say, get her done. What does that mean? Get her done. Take a high speed hand piece and pulverize the tooth. Do whatever you can, but don't hurt the buckle plate. Every time you go to either sectioning the tooth, reflecting a flap, getting it done, there's less likelihood of an immediate placement gonna happen that day. Be clear about that. So atraumatic extraction, Riley, has been my key to knowing that I'm doing a great job for my patient. The periodontium's not gonna melt down. I'm not gonna have all of this dehiscence. I'm not gonna have any of these challenges because of traumatic extractions. Do we create trauma when we take out teeth? Certainly. I get it, it's not an easy task for anybody, even if you're a real pro at this, but you have to always remember bone sets the tone for these implants and blood supply and atraumatic handling of the tissues, the bone, uh, make a huge difference for you. So I hope some of this was helpful for you. Um, I, I really believe in this stuff. I think that what we were taught in dental school uh, is, is barbaric and should, uh, we, should, we should, you know, start to think differently about those extractions and those people that taught us how to do that to another human should have that done to them. I think the key is, you know, let's make sure we're spending our time um, taking the tooth out carefully. It's not a race. Um, I know we all fight a schedule every day when we go to work, but we might be wise to maybe add a few extra minutes to a surgical procedure when an extraction's involved and an implant's going to go in that day, just because it really does set us up for success or failure based on how well that extraction goes. And equipment. If you don't have the right equipment, you don't have periotomes, you don't have good elevators, uh, go out and buy them. You have to have them. It's a great investment. Okay, number two, biotype. Tell us your thoughts on biotype. Why is that going to be real important for immediate placement? Well, you know, biotype is one of those words that we were hounded by the periodontists who were all weird in our dental schools. And we, we kind of wanted to shun that, that kind of talk. But biotype is critical to everything. I think it has to, it, it's, it's interesting to me. I believe that bad biotype has questionable bone under it. I believe that good biotype has bone under it. What came first, the biotype or the bone? I think it came together. I think the robust, very uh, beautiful, stippled, uh, keratinized tissue attached to the bone is where I want to work. When I look at these two pictures, they're diametrically opposed to each other. The one horrifies me. It scares me because it's not stable. The other is stable. So biotype is something that we have to start to train our eyes to see because it's not typical for us to talk biotype. We don't even, some people, you know, say, well, what are you talking about? What is biotype? It's the type of tissue. It's the condition of the tissue. It's whether it's attached or not attached. Is it stippled or not stippled? Does it bleed upon gentle probing or not? Is it inflamed? Both these pictures, I think, epitomize a very delicate biotype, which make me a little nervous to doing immediate anything in this case without fortifying it first and maybe regenerating a new biotype through some soft tissue grafting procedures. And the other one is a, a no brainer. So anyway, that's what I mean about biotype. And I think it's important, uh, the atraumatic extraction coupled with a reasonable biotype equals a good or a reasonable outcome. If the biotype is sketchy, if the extraction is sketchy, one has to say, maybe I shouldn't fly today. Maybe should keep the plane in the hangar and not do this immediate procedure. 
but, but be aware, you can spot this a mile away ahead of time so you're not painting yourself in a corner with your patients promising something and then not delivering the goods on a regular basis. Once in a blue moon, I would say five times last year, I could not do the immediate because I could not feel clinically that I was doing the patient a favor. But for those five times I couldn't, there was probably a hundred times that I could or, or many more. So that gives you kind of a, a feeling of, of, of the percentage of when you're gonna not fly or fly when you've told the patient that you think you can. So realize that the bone underneath the tissue is going to get some of its blood supply from the periosteum. So the thicker the biotype, typically the more rich the vascularity is for that bone. And so we can do things like take out teeth, traumatize the bone a little, put in an implant by traumatizing the bone a little, put in bone graft. But with that rich protective blood supply on the outside, they heal really well. I had a case this week, uncovered seven implants on the top. We took out all the teeth, put in all the implants, did some massive grafting around some very large osseous defects, and uncovering it, I was actually surprised how good the bone was. Um, but her biotype was thicker than even this picture right here. So that biotype really does um, make a difference. So, so far in the immediate placement story, if you want to shoot yourself in the foot, get aggressive on your extraction, break off the buckle plate, preoperatively think that that thin biotype on the right is a good patient to try an immediate placement with. So far, your case is going straight to the garbage can pretty quickly. One last comment, Riley. If you look at this name, <clears throat> this kind of questionable biotype picture, the, the fact is if you were to reflect a flap and do sulcular incisions around that, it's likely nothing's going to heal where it was today. In fact, because it's so edematous, it's, it, it's going to be a real sketchy heal. And so, that's always disturbing to me is when a patient says, hey, when you did, when, when I started, my tooth was only an inch long, which is way too long, but now it's an inch and a half long, what goes? And, you know, and the fact is, there's probably very little buckle plate on those teeth that are showing uh, that inflammatory reaction, as well as the thin, translucent or almost transparent biotypes. So those are the top two. The third is equally as important and it's called pathology, free, free of pathology. Now, if you look at the one slide, the PA, really you might visualize something right here, maybe something there, but you're not 100% sure if the patient weren't symptomatic, you might not even look as close, but there's the CT you've got a massive, large cyst, and that's going to be full of pathology. That's, that's a histologic uh, response. You've got an epithelial cyst. A cyst in dentistry is a good thing because the body's encapsulating the yuck caused by the necrotic pulp. But this always uh, presents a problem. If you don't know that there's a cyst there, then you could, you could, Take the tooth out atraumatically, think all was well, leave the cyst in, put the implant in, and all heck will break loose. And it will happen in three days. And it's a disaster. I've read about it. <laughs> I've read, I read a lot. But please don't get into that trouble. If you are going to do an immediate placement, I think in today's world, you need a, a 3D rendering uh, for sure. And this, this will make a big difference. Any experience with that, Riley, that you want to comment on? You just need to be really thoughtful. I think all of us need to really evaluate the apical anatomy of bone around these teeth, make sure it's clean. When the tooth comes out, that's probably half of the task for an extraction. Um, the second half of the task is to make sure the bone is prepared. It's cleaned, it's debride, it's flushed. Um, you might take a tooth out in two to three minutes, and then you might spend five or six, seven minutes actually cleaning up the extraction site. I like a rotary instrument, Linderman drill, um, with some water. It goes down there, and you can actually clean up the apical end of the extraction site really, really well. And then I flush it out with two, three, four monojet syringes um, every time. Healthy tooth, two, three monojet syringes. If there's pathology in there, I'm going to spend a little bit more time cleaning and flush it out, maybe five, six, seven monojets. Sounds crazy, but we really can't put an implant, which is a transplant, 
into an area where there's active pathology around. The axiom is the solution to pollution is dilution. So use a lot of uh, dilution. And uh, a lot of us just use our slow speed handpiece and our implant uh, motor with a lot of uh, irrigation and use a, a side cutter or Lindemann burr. The, the fallacy is we were taught to do this in dental school wrong. To take the tooth out, I'd, I'd suggest uh, you use a, a soft tissue curette to, you know, to remove the tissue from the tooth, the, the biologic width. And uh, that's called a supercrestal fibrotomy. And do that with the right instrument, not a periosteal elevator like we were all taught. And then when you're cleaning out that, that soft tissue curette is, is really bogus in my opinion, use a rotary, really clean out those periodontal ligament fibers, uh, get any cystic uh, debris out of there. And here's a rule of thumb, and, and please listen up. If you see a PA that has a radiolucency at the apical end between six and 11, I will tell you from a lot of experience with this that 90 plus percent, the cyst is in the buccal plate. So even if you were to extract the tooth and clean it all out, even with the rotaries we're talking about, there still is a remnant or a portion of that cyst that is in the buccal plate. So when I see that PA with that, I just reflect a flap. Now you can reflect the flap way high in the vestibule and just do a horizontal incision and not disrupt the periodontium around teeth. And then you'll see it, you'll be able to, uh, uh, take that out of there, clean it all up, lots of irrigation, and then perhaps you will continue to do whatever it is you set out to do. But that's only in the upper arch and it's only between six and 11. I can't say that I, I see that anywhere else in the body uh, or in the mouth, uh, the jaws, but that's just a rule of thumb that will help you. So be really careful suggesting that you're gonna do an immediate implant on anything with pathology to the very obvious or not so obvious. The other thing is if you've got active uh, exudate, I, I wouldn't do it that day. And if you can't get the patient numb and you're doing all the tricks you know, that's a big red flag that there's a cellu cellulitis of a pH change that isn't healthy and don't proceed that day. So that's the most subtle reason I wouldn't do it. I can't get them numb and I should be able to. And this obvious stuff that we're showing you on the screen. So those are the big three. We spend a good time explaining those three, but those are probably the big three topics that are gonna play a big role with your immediate placement. So I think that was time well spent. Real quick, what are the advantages of immediate placement? Well, the big advantage is decreased treatment time. If you can get the bone graft and the implant to heal simultaneous versus one after the other, that's a huge plus for your efficiency and certainly for the patient. Um, less surgical appointments, and because it's less surgery, it's less invasive. So those are your big, big advantages. And then I think in the aesthetic zone, especially in the upper uh, aesthetic area, it the big advantage to me is you maintain the periodontium scallop of the marginal epithelium because you haven't let it fall in. You haven't let it remodel itself and then try to push it back and then make it look normal. So with the what, temporary, you're saying? With the temporary or uh, a healing abutment that yes. is properly, uh, you know, sized up for that. So I think these are uh, clearly the advantages of it. There are definitely some disadvantages uh, if you choose wrong. So more technique sensitive. I hear a lot of doctors that are just maybe newer to implantology. They don't want to tackle that. And I totally get it. You do need to, number one, visualize all of the anatomy. And so having a CT image, I think is really important before you go and drill beyond an apex of a tooth. We'll talk about that in a couple of slides, but it is more technique sensitive. You often are not gonna be getting primary closure. So you do not have a contiguous blood supply all the way over the coronal aspect of your surgery site. So because of all those things, it is a little bit more risky. So those are some of the disadvantages. You know, Riley though, you know, we are combining immediate placement with immediate load, but obviously you could just do an immediate placement. You could reflect all that tissue. You could bring it all over and get primary closure. I don't, that doesn't make sense to me because you're displacing the keratinized tissue. I, I borrow it from time to time and then I give it back for, for certain circumstances. But overall, it's the nicest thing is to maintain the periodontium and the scallop of those teeth 
But uh, it definitely is something, if you're very uncomfortable with the notion, just find a friend that does it a lot, uh, mentor with them, get some good advice, and you'll, you'll, you'll have a long runway and a long flight of doing these for your patients uh, for many, many years, hopefully uh, decades. So here's some contraindications. We alluded to this already, but if exudate is present at extraction, I certainly would not um, put an implant in that day. I probably wouldn't put a bone graft in. I'd probably clean it up the best I could that day, put them on an antibiotic and see them seven to 14 days later and do an early delayed bone graft implant placement. This is the craziest thing. I get calls on a regular basis and they say, hey, I took out the tooth. It wasn't worthy for an implant, so I did a bone graft. Now, think about that. If it's not worthy for an implant, the site is not worthy, it's certainly not worthy for a bone graft. Be clear on that. A bone graft requires more worthiness than even an implant because the bone graft is, is solving that huge vacancy where the implant is just integrating to the surface of the implant. So I agree with Riley. Two or three days later, a week later, bring them back after being on antibiotics. You've already used side cutters. You've de debrided the area uh, in a grand way. You've removed cysts. You've done all of that. Then you can go back and do it. But don't be such a, a Rambo. Don't be so adamant you have to do it today. Sometimes less is best and slowing down will pay dividends. Your patients will certainly appreciate it if you explain why you're doing what you're doing. Other things to consider, um, bone issues. So if there's no apical bone in some areas, I'll show you where that can be a big problem. If there's big bony defects. Now, advanced techniques, you can maybe work around those. I think if it were me and if you haven't done over 100 immediate placements, I probably wouldn't try to graft a big, large defect um, after an extraction with an implant placed. I think you want to have those good bony walls intact. Um, and then poor health history. We talked about that, but if they just simply are not a good health profile patient, I find a poor bone graft does not turn out nearly as bad as a poor bone graft with implant placement. There seems to be a bigger sequela that follows that implant bone graft combo. So if there is going to be some concerns with their healing, let's not get the implant involved at that time, get the patient's hopes up and then most likely just have a, a bigger issue than we would have with just a bone graft. So when in doubt, take it a little slower. I think that's my recommendation um, right there. So let's talk about tooth sites for a little bit. We've got molars to talk about, premolars to talk about, aesthetic zones. The maxillary molar is probably the most exotic when we start talking about immediate placements just because of that trifurcated root. That's a difficult one to land right in the middle of all of that bone, getting it to just land right in the middle. I wish it was that easy on a picture on the screen. It looks easy, but it's not really that easy to get it right there. Um, I think this is a really tough site and something we have to consider with maxillary molars is the actual anatomy. So this is very, very typical. If you're not using CTs in your office routinely, you might not realize this, but I bet I don't know the exact data, but just my clinical observations, I bet 40, 50% of patients, this is what the bone looks like around these maxillary molars. So you could take out a tooth, measure down to the extent of a, a palatal cusp or a palatal root, and then you might think, okay, that's how much I can drill. But here you clearly see there is not that much bone in the middle furcation area, and you're going to be right into the sinus um, that would be a mistake. So you got to be very careful with these molars. Um, molars, in my opinion, for a, a newer implantologist, it's a great graft and come back later type situation. Um, any other thoughts with maxillary molars? I think uh, maxillary molars are tough. I started doing these about 15, 17 years ago, and I thought I never would do them. And they always make me uncomfortable. Uh, I think the best way to do these is graft them with a nice uh, grafting material for two reasons, to uh, preserve what bone is there and to mitigate the pneumatization of the maxillary sinus uh, downward. Because you, the extractions of a trifurcated uh, root is challenging by, for sure, section those, take them all out individually, all three roots, and then clean it all up, put a nice stalwart bone graft in, and then go back in three months. And in this case, it wouldn't even matter if you bone grafted it, you're still gonna have to do a sinus lift. 
but this could be a crustal sinus lift with some of the, the guided uh, technology out there. It could certainly be a lateral window. I think a crustal might make more sense here. I think if you're a more advanced implantologist and you want to tackle something like this immediately, I would certainly recommend a guided surgery. That's going to help get your drill exactly where it belongs. If you're going to do a simultaneous sinus graft with it, you just want to make sure you have good bony architecture of the walls. You want to make sure it's the thick biotype of tissue. You want to make sure the patient profile is right. I've done a couple um, where you take a tooth like this out, you graft it, sinus bump it and implant. Um, they're exciting when they go well and they're frustrating when they don't. I also have read about that. So there are some techniques to work around them, but I think this is a great one just to come back later and, and deal with after a, a socket preservation. The mandibular molar is very similar with the bifurcated root. Um, what's tricky with this one, it's very hard not to fall into one of the roots. And so that's a real tricky thing, hat trick to get it right there. The anatomy of the roots, how much they flare out, often for me is an indication of how easy or difficult it would be um, to get an implant in the same day. So tricky we've, one. We put two, two small implants into each root, but it becomes a prosthetic challenge uh, doing that. So I'm not sure I'm as keen on that as I was at one time. By the time you do your osteotomy right down the center, you have just a big hole. And it's likely even on the insertion of the implant, it can wander into one of the legs. And what you wanna do is if you're gonna miss the center between the tooth, tooth, be a little bit more distal because that being more mesial is a problem because you've got a cantilever. Uh, so anyway, I think at the end of the day, what we're saying is clean them all out, make this a bone graft, come back in three months and you'll have a much better experience. The patient isn't, going to be that adamant on that tooth space in a molar position that it has to be all done all in one. Uh, it's usually something that shows, something that bothers them aesthetically. And you know what, what's nice is you know we're saying that grafting these might be the way to, to go and often these molars are the ones that give us more problem with the atraumatic extraction techniques. So it might, it might make sense that if we fought the tooth it was tough because of the multiple roots by grafting it, we're just hedging our bet that we're gonna have a better opportunity to get the implant in good bone later. So that, that's kind of uh, lending itself towards that. Premolars, um, so premolars, you kinda of wanna shoot for right in the middle of these, making sure you leave what we call a buckle gap, which is a space between the buckle plate within the extraction site and the buckle surface of your implant. Um, the last thing you wanna do is take out a tooth put in an implant and have your implant be right up against the buckle plate. That's going to be a bad, a bad and thing. I, and I, I'm going to clarify, a premolar on the maxilla is going to leave a very big buckle space, sometimes even a palatal space, but it needs to be right in the center. If you're following a furcated root, then, you know, perform your osteotomy in the palatal uh, furca, and then it'll expand into the buccal for uh, bone space. But, uh, and the, the lowers we feel, uh, I, have, I have very strong feelings of uh, the lower premolar. I would just put the implant where the tooth was. Don't go any further, don't go any, just make it fit. Especially in your tooth numbers uh, 21 and 29, uh, 20, 28, your, uh, actually no, number 20 and 29, you're going to be so close to the nerve that it, it, it makes no sense to go deeper. There's a fallacy in immediate placement. You have to go three millimeters apical to where the tooth was. That's simply not true. That has to do with primary stability. The implant anatomy has changed. We have power threads at the apical end and you can literally put an implant in 20 and 29, basically right smack just measure it. Measure the buccal plate to the apical end, minus two millimeters, that's your length. Then take the length and take your implant, three, five drill, put it in, no, too loose, four, oh, drill, do you follow, out of your surgical kit, just put it in the hole, whatever tugs back like a paper point, tug back for endo, that is your choice of your diameter, your length was determined by the length, buccal plate, minus one or two, boom, put it in. It takes 30 seconds. No big deal. Your 21 and your 28 
I think you have to be uh, uh, very aware of the anterior loop on the, on the, the mental nerve. Uh, sometimes you can go way apical or way, yeah, way apical on those and no problem, but I would be beware. So our, we're saying maxillary uh, premolars use the palatal root space. And, and put them, put them in, uh, in the center with maybe a little bone grafting buckle and poly on the mandible. I don't even, rarely do I have room to do to, to any bone grafting, but they fit very beautifully. So that might be some rules of thumb that you could kind of pigeonhole some of your decision making uh, in a category of that. There's always extenuating circumstances. I think if I was new to immediate placement, I would probably start with maxillary premolars. I think they're a very safe place to start because of typically the very long buccal lingual dimension. There isn't a lot of anatomy up there that you're going to be concerned with. Sometimes those second premolars are close to the sinus, but not always. The fallacy is I hear a lot of doctors, they start with mandibular first um, or second premolars. And I just think that's really tricky. The nerve is right there. If you're a two-dimensional dentist and you see the mental foramen right under that second premolar, don't think that that gives you the opportunity to go deeper in that first premolar position. Um, it's been sad experience to talk to a few clinicians that maybe haven't considered that anterior loop as thoughtfully as they should have um, and gone too deep. And that, that's, that's a problem. So be careful with that. My recommendation, if you're new to immediates, start with the upper premolars. I think it's a great place to start. Okay, anterior. Anterior follows of kind of a similar thing. We're gonna stay off the buccal plate and we're gonna basically look at where the apex of the natural tooth is. And we want to visualize the apex of our implant being more apical and more palatal or more lingual. And so here you're seeing the red star on the right. You see where the apex once was and where it is now. That is a very common technique that we want to follow is always apicalize and lingualize. It's a hat trick to do. You see there in the middle using some type of lance drill to perforate the lamina dura high up the wall and then to help guide you without falling back into that natural extraction socket. That's a technique I like to use now with guided surgery. I don't have to be so clever with my freehand approach and it lands a lot more gracefully. But this is really, really important that you apicalize and palatalize your implant. So Premolars, upper or lower, are within the lamina dura of the extraction site. The exception is what we're talking about from 6 to 11 and 22 to 27. There are opportunities to remove lamina dura, especially on the lingual or palatal, and translate that implant more palatally, leaving a space. So what's good for the tooth is not good for the implant in the, the upper or lower uh, canine to canine areas, and you have to uh, somehow, you know, surgically get that lamina dura out of the way and go apical to the extraction site. And so the two rules of thumb on that is apicalize it, meaning it's a little more subcrestal than uh, it would be otherwise, and it's lingualized or palatalized. And uh, guided surgery makes that a no-brainer. You don't have to think about it. If you're freehanding it, use a side cutting burr and gouge till you blow through that uh, palatal lamina dura, which is cortical bone. It's not uh, vascularized. It's a good idea. Get into the bloody bone and place the implant. So that, that's a whole day lecture, but that's uh, basically boiling it down to a few uh, rules of thumb. So here's kind of just a summary slide highlighting a couple of, of thoughts here. Um, it's all color coded here, but basically in blue for the anteriors, we're going to apicalize and lingualize. Maxillary premolars are going to be somewhat centered. And then you got to be careful of the maxillary sinus in your second premolar position. In yellow is your mandibular premolars. You got to be careful about the anterior loop. And we're never, hardly never drilling deeper than the tooth apex. And so I think that's a great rule of thumb. And then again, in review, in green with your molars, I think it's graft and weight. I think that's a very predictable workflow as you advance with your implant skill set. There are opportunities to go um, and maybe some modify these rules a little bit. 
But again, I think this is a great kind of preliminary how to get started with immediate placements. And really, I think the lower could be a good place for immediate placements. You're just putting it in the hole. And you might just run a, a burr or two. So it might be that you've chosen a four by 10. You just use that last osteotomy burr in your kit, which is a four by 10 and go down and round out it a little bit then put the implant in. I've also placed many implants in the mandibular immediate extraction site in premolars without ever even doing any drilling. It just fit and just put it in. And I had no, no guilt charging them what I charge them because that makes up for all the times I have to blood, sweat, and tear the implant in. So real quick, um, we're a little behind schedule, but real quick, there is a, a concept of the buckle gap or gap space. Um, do we graft it or not graft it? This is debated a lot in implant dentistry. There's some research out there um, that suggests that if that gap is less than a two millimeter space, meaning the internal side of the buckle plate, to the external anatomy of the implant. If that is less than two millimeters, maybe it does not need grafted. For me, if there's a space and I can put any bone in there, I graft every time. Um, I just feel like why not? It's gonna help maintain that space a little bit better. I just feel better with it. I typically have harvested bone while drilling and I can put that in there. If not, what we like is a 50-50 mixture up against the buckle plate, except at the very top corner. So if you look up here, I have a couple of colors here. This is a mixture of bone graft here on the buckle plate. And as we get up near this edge, we really wanna fortify this area and have no marginal bone loss. Putting something that is very osteoconductive uh, is gonna be very helpful to help maintain that space and maintain bone there. So something more like a bovine product is what I like there. We, we like, a, we like a, um, a bovine product up here. Um, and a 50-50 uh, cadaver bone and, and a bovine here. This will grow bone quickly, but also maintain some space. This will maintain the space beautifully. Uh, BioWAS is the premium product in the industry. Uh, everyone thinks they can copy BioWAS, but they cannot. BioWAS is the way to go here. And those are the two things that you're balancing. It's the maintenance of space and then growing bone quick. And we need to be respectful of both principles, the osteoinductive properties, the osteoconductive properties. And so by getting a mix, we kind of get a hybrid approach where we're doing that. Again, not a bone grafting course and we're a little behind, but I think that's, that's kind of our bone grafting strategy around there. Last slide on immediate placement, um, and then we'll get into more immediate load, but I will say it's been a game changer to go more to a digital workflow and a guided surgery when we talk about immediate placement. You look at um, the slides here, it can be tricky to not fall into the apex of an extraction site when drilling, no matter where it is. Um, and with guided surgery, it just it kind of points you in a direction, lets you follow it a lot more predictable. But the, the funny thing is some doctors will say, I think guided surgery is great for all on six, upper and lower, knowing all these changes have occurred. I can do this freehand in an immediate extraction site. And the, the truth be told, that's, that's actually not true. These are tough to put the implant exactly where you want to put it uh, for prosthetics. And of course, implant placement's always prosthetically driven. So I agree with you, Riley, that it has changed the game. Uh, you younger doctors who've never freehanded for years, uh, good for you. You don't have to. You can join you know, the digital revolution and, and, and it'll be easier for you. We'll take about 10 minutes and go through some immediate loading protocols um, and just some thoughts about that. Um, real quick, factors to consider, patient expectations, bone quality, bone quantity, occlusion, um, jaw relationships, the cost of it all, patient compliance. Last thing you want to do, put an implant in, put a great temporary on it, and have a patient you don't trust go and start eating hamburgers and beef jerky that next day on a number eight. That's going to be a problem. Um, tooth site specific, absolutely. And then make sure you have a drilling strategy that's going to make sense. So those are some factors. I think perhaps, um, I don't know if there's a most important one, but the occlusal setup in my mind is huge and then the bone quality and quantity is huge. And I think occlusion and jaw relationship. Uh, your class two, 100% overbite, be careful. 
those are really, really tricky. They, they, are, uh, they are the kiss of death if you do a, an immediate load and don't understand that occlusion and cross over and thinking about the patient sleeping on a pillow at night, their jaw goes way over. Make sure you, you, you adjust accordingly. Uh, I, I think uh, less is best. If you worry about it, it, it causes you some sleep, keeps you up at night, don't do it on that particular patient. The advantages are obviously patient satisfaction is probably the biggest advantage. Patients want that, they love that, they hate the idea of a removable appliance if it's somewhere that it can be seen. Um, from a clinician standpoint, the soft tissue contour is fantastic on these cases where we can do an immediate load. You just get such a beautiful soft tissue result very quickly, um, which allows the final restorative processes to go even better. Um, it is a little bit of an, an office reputation builder. Um, there's offices that are known that, hey, we do immediate temporaries and there's some, oh, we don't. And that, that can be a game changer from a business standpoint. Disadvantages, there's a lot of potential for complication. Um, if you don't manage it right, if the force isn't done right, if we're not considering certain factors the right way, I think we can have some major uh, disappointment, which is frustrating because it does cost more. And so expectations are higher just because the finances had a higher price tag on it. So that's a little overview of immediate loading. Here are some things I think we really need to consider, just some general recommendations and tips and tricks. Anytime I'm putting two implants next to each other and we're gonna do immediate temps, they're always gonna be splinted. I can't think of a, a single situation where I would not splint two implants right next to each other that just got placed and I'm gonna put temporaries on them. They're always gonna be splinted. One plus one equals like three and a half in terms of strength with implants next to each other splinted. We're gonna avoid cantilevers. Um, on full arch cases, there might be some opportunity to do a very slight cantilever immediately, but I don't like long cantilevers on my immediate cases, full arch or more smaller unit. Screw retained access, I think is really, really important. These are gonna come in and out a couple of times possibly for impression taking and things like that. So if you have an easy way to take the temporary apart and put it back together, that's gonna make your life really easy. I've spent a lot of time cutting off temps to do something just to build a brand new temporary again and that, that isn't the most efficient workflow. Um, maximize bony boundaries with implant size. I like a larger implant, both in length and diameter, trying to maximize its capacity to meet cortical type um, bone, stronger bone. I know there's some people out there that love a four by 10 for everything. Um, I'm not in that camp. I like to try to offer immediate load to my patients when I can. And one way to do that is to make sure I'm using longer, wider implants so I get very good initial stability. And with the digital workflow in today's world, we can optimize uh, cortical boundaries, both buccal and lingual, and the inferior cortical boundary and the superior cortical boundary. So it makes sense if you can keep that implant in trabecular bone, but optimize those boundaries with an implant that's specifically designed to enhance primary stability, you're, you're way ahead of uh, the pack. Uh, set clear expectations for your patients. I refer to these immediate load temporaries as a cosmetic tooth, not a functional tooth. I tell them they can smile at their spouse, but I don't want them eating heavy foods with that. Um, and I think that's really important. Sometimes we just call it a surgical band-aid. This is a surgical band-aid so you don't look like a freak of nature. <laughs> Yeah. And that way they, they feel, okay, I get it. It's a surgical band-aid. And you'll get the functional uh, outcome later, but you got to be a good patient with your cosmetic or your surgical band-aid solution. This is just so you can go and be social. And patients are good with that typically. They're not looking for a temporary to go to put it to work other than to smile, um, to go to work and be socially acceptable. So... Um, from an occlusion standpoint, I like to reduce the lingual cusps, very, very minimal if, if at all, even having them. No lateral contact, so an excursive, there's no contact whatsoever on that temporary. And then when you do a post-op, and you're going to want to do a post-op, maybe even a 48-hour or one week, um, check the bite. So make sure sometimes at post-ops for surgery, you don't think to have you know, a hand piece out and some articulating tape, but that needs to be on the tray and you look at the bite adjusted as needed. That's really important. Let your front office know if this patient who has an immediate uh, load calls, 
their, their implant seems loose, their temporary seems loose. It is not talk them out of coming in. It's talk them into getting here ASAP so you can maybe uh, solve a, a, a pending crisis. And then on a full arch type temporary, I tell the patient, you know, it would be considered an emergency if you feel like your temporary has broken anywhere because you might lose that splinting effect um, for cross arch stabilization. So that, that's a very big deal. I've had a couple of cases break right at your back implant and then it's sitting solo. They didn't think it was a big deal and I lose my most distal implant, which is a devastating implant to lose on a full arch case. Uh, it's an anchor type implant. And then lastly, you want to utilize, in my opinion, really good data to evaluate the stability. And so we're going to utilize torque testing and a Newton centimeter value and then an ISQ test, an implant stability quotient. I think the more data we have to compel us to know the, you know, the, where the implant is from a strength standpoint is going to be really helpful. We're not talking after the fact. We're talking intraoperatively. You just put in the implant. You're making the final decision. I'm going to immediate load. You need to feel like you've had 35 newtons of newton centimeter uh, pressure in inserting the implant at least minimally and ISQ of 70 or above. Really what it boils down to is stability. Um, end of the day, when I go into a case, you might think you're going to do an immediate load, but you don't know until you put that implant in and you have some form of stability. And so stability is the game. Um, that is 100% what we're worried about, what we're working towards during our implant planning process and the implant surgery. What's great today with technology, especially in a digital type workflow where my DICOMs, my STLs are being sent somewhere, I can get some analysis of what the bone quality looks like and what is the probability of that bone quality giving me some stability or how might that bone quality affect my drilling protocol. So here you see a map literally showing you all of the implant surfaces and showing where is it D1, D2, D3, D4. And this implant here is primarily D3. So the drilling protocol for this is going to be very different if my goal is to load it or not to load it, as it would be different to drill a implant that was a D2 versus a D3. And so these are some of the strategies that we need to think about um, it's always easy to undersize the osteotomy, and if it's too tight, I can take it out and make it bigger. In short, if you make the hole too big, that's going to be a problem to get your stability. But here's where optimizing cortical boundaries comes in. If you put an implant, I don't care how big or small in jello, it's still in jello. But if you can put it in and optimize cortical boundaries within that, that D3 bone, you're going to be more primarily stable than you would be if you had a, a big distance uh, to the inferior border or the buccal border or any border. Um, I just want to highlight the two di different types of stability that we deal with. We have primary stability, which is just mechanical. I call that Home Depot stability. That's like getting a piece of wood and a screw and screwing it in. That's mechanical stability. Um, in wood, it stays for a long time or forever because that wood is not turning over and changing. In the body, that mechanical stability is going to change because the bone is turning over and changing constantly. The stability that we're hoping to have eventually is the secondary stability or biologic stability or osseointegration is the $10 word. The highlight here is just realizing that between week one and a half and week five or six, there is a big transition where the patient is going from a state of mechanical stability to biological stability and the patient needs to be reminded because after a month I find they get used to the temporary and maybe they're not as cautious they're going to start chewing on it they're going to start doing things they shouldn't and I remind them the implant is weaker at week three and four than it probably was um, at week one and um, now if you saw our lecture on UV activation, there's some great things that are changing in the industry to make that happen quicker. But if you're not using a UV activated implant, um, then you need to be very thoughtful during that one, two, three week, four week process. And the patient needs to be aware of that. The more they know, the better they can be a, a good behavior um, for, for our, our goal. Um, just here's a quick example. This happens to be a case I saw this week. They came in, they really wanted this tooth out. It's broken. 
not very sightly, um, non-restorable, sent to me from a referral from a clinician in town. And he really wants an immediate temp on it. For me, I can almost promise the patient when I see something like this, oh yeah, we could do an immediate um, temporary because look at all of that apical bone. In the aesthetic area, I do like grabbing as much apical bone as possible. People always ask, how do you know if you can do a temp or not on an eight or nine or a six or 11? For me, I need a CT, I need a cross section and see how much apical bone is there before I hit the nose. And if there's a lot of apical bone and it's decent quality, it's almost a guarantee. I'd be very, very surprised if I couldn't get initial stability. If the jaw relationship and the occlusal scheme is acceptable, if it's not acceptable, it doesn't matter how much apical bone there is, you're gonna have problems. Just because you can get stability doesn't mean you should put a temp on it. That's cool. I know I can get stability. The question now is, are the physics gonna allow me within the nathologic system to give them that and actually have it work? But question one, is it even a possibility? Yeah. So I look at the CT when I go into a consult, if I can just tell, oh, there's no chance, I don't even bring up immediate temps because there's no point in even really diving down it. Or I might mention, yeah, I looked at your bone, you're not a good candidate for that. So the very first thing is make sure you look at the bone and just realize what's what's possible. But that's they don't all look like that. That's probably more of an extreme case, but this is a great candidate for an immediate placement, immediate load, if the nathologic principles are right. There's just a more zoomed in picture for you. Lots of space there. ISQ, real quick, if you're not on the ISQ train, I'd, I'd recommend you get on it. It gives you a numerical um, number that tells you how strong the implant is. It's like taking a test. You need 70 to pass. 70 is the magic number. The torque test is great. It tells you that the implant is tight somewhere along the long axis. The ISQ test tells you what percentage, basically, of the implant surface is tight to the bone. Those are two very different concepts. And so I'm a big fan of the ISQ technology. And we're not suggesting torque test and ISQ. If you don't have an ISQ uh, penguin or something, then you have to rely on the torque test. But really the torque test is uh, old. It, it isn't as great as we thought it was. The ISQ is the new guy on the block. I think everybody should have an ISQ machine. Yeah, not to sound like a commercial, we've used a few different machines. The Penguin is a great device out there. Um, look it up. It, it's really economically at a good price point and it's just clinically really easy to use. I, that's the one I would recommend. Um, I have a couple of cases and I'm gonna go through them lightning fast and just highlight a few differences in these two cases. Um, this patient came in and was constantly breaking their definitive restorations in seven and 10. Post and cores were done, they were redone, they were redone, eventually leaving such little tooth structure left, it wasn't possible to keep using the tooth. And so they were sent to me by referral um, for implants in seven and 10. I'm gonna go through this somewhat quickly. I had a guide made and I had a matrix made to make it temporary. Um, we took out the teeth atraumatically, put the guide on, used a guided workflow to drill our osteotomy, undersizing our osteotomy to get good initial stability. Loaded up our implant, put our implants in. I got great stability. I ISQ'd them and I told you 70 is a passing score and a really good score. 83 is phenomenal. The question is, did I put on a temporary on the implants that day? And I think some of you might be thinking, well, heck yeah, it's stable. But to my dad's good point, just because it's stable, we have to look at other principles. Look at the wear on these teeth. This view might be better. There's a lot of incisal wear. He has a collapsed bite. He is breaking definitive restorations. His occlusal setup, in my opinion, is not a good candidate for immediate load. But what you did, Riley, and I know time is an essence, but you put in PRP right here. That's, that's, right. that's amazing. You did a little white cap institute trick where you put some flowable composite to maintain the periodontium as a custom uh, ginger former, then take it from there. So, so check cool. this out. So I go ahead and I put a little, I call it the non-resorbable membrane called flowable composite. I just lay it right on top of the PRF and then I use acid etch and I put a little on both sides of the teeth here and then I run a composite bridge from side to side. That's acting like rebar for my temporary material. 
And so then we fill up our Siltec matrix. I push it on and I'm getting chemical retention onto this flowable composite, which is bonded to the adjacent teeth. It's a really clever trick. Obviously the teeth need to be polished down later and get all that residue off later. In this case, these teeth are scheduled for crown prep. So I really didn't care about giving, going into the, the tooth structure at all. And thank goodness they were natural teeth so I could use this trick. But basically we just made a composite rebar from tooth to tooth, hooked our temporaries onto it. And that was the final result. Um, if I had more time, I'd explain more about this technique, but that, that's a great result in terms of the temporaries, in my opinion, and then obviously a great surgical result, um, obviously because it was guided. We used some good technology. Notice a small healing abutment was placed not to protrude through the tissue, but to be a scaffold or an extension of the implant to hold some of the particulate. That's a very clever, savvy little trick. Don't, don't. Don't underestimate that. Put that in your notes. So that's one case where we took out some teeth, put implants in, had fantastic stability, but we did not immediately load the implant. We gave fixed temps with a clever workaround we just showed you, but all of the parameters were not in harmony that it was indicated, in my opinion, to put those temps on. Those temps were very strong. He was told not to chew with the front teeth use a fork and knife, eat whatever you want on the back, but don't chew on the front. He came in a day later, broke one of them off because he was eating a big hamburger down the road. But don't you think that confirmed your clinical yeah. decision not to load those uh, immediately? Great patient, love him to death, but he, you could tell he probably wasn't going to be very compliant and he wasn't. And so I'm glad we read that right and we, we did the right thing here. One more case, um, anterior bridge. And this, the reason I show you all these pictures, I like on these big important cases where aesthetics are involved and I have all of my money on fixed temporaries of having a backup plan, meaning a flipper or an Essex, because if you are planning on, let's say you, you send the case to a lab, you order up these great fixed temporaries, but what if you don't get initial stability? Do you have a backup plan to give the patient and I've paid for, and I've had uh, probably my dad pay for it because it's his business, <laughs> a lot of temporaries that never got used because we did get the result we were looking for. That's just a risk. And I tell the patient, I'm going to have to charge you for this. We need a backup plan. Um, so, um, but be aware of that. If this looks funny to you, this is a lot of cases for me. I have an Essex for this patient, a flipper for this patient, and a fixed temporary option. My hope is fixed temporary. But what you could do, Riley, you could attach a fish hook to the unused removable appliance you didn't use if there was primary stability and they could use it as a fancy fishing lure. It's true. We could call it the, the dental lure. Yeah, I like it. So we, we've got options here and you can sell them that. Um, it'll be on the online store probably by the end of the, end of, end of the, day. End of the day. It'll be there now. So here's the case. Um, six, seven, and 10 need to be extracted. There's a bridge it's failed six and seven have issues. 10 was a sacrificial extraction because number nine would need a block graft and the patient elected not to have the grafting done, elected to have number 10 taken out so we could put an implant there. So we're going to remove the bridge, take out six, seven, and 10, and then put in three implants and load it all up. So teeth are out, guide is on, implants are in, in this case, the lab made um, modifications to stock abutments. I'm putting them in. And then here's what's really clever with this case as well. A digital workflow was followed. In the workflow, we realized that the flare of the bone in number 10 was about 30 degrees off to create parallelism for the implants on the right side. And so we actually used a multi-unit abutment, multi-angled, um, and we brought the angle back palatal 30 degrees so that all of my abutments can line up properly. So this abutment is sitting on top of a 30 degree angled abutment in this area going to the implant. So very clever workaround that was discovered in the virtual planning versus finding that out chair side. I've, I've found that out chair side once or twice and it's not nearly as efficient to figure out a solution um, chair side. Temporary goes on. In this case, it's just a passive fit temporary. And what I mean by that is there's just a big hole in the temporary and you just have to kind of loot it, 
hold it in the right spot. So it's a little bit like shooting from the hip, but it works pretty good. Um, we loot the temporary cylinders and that's how the patient left. So they came in with the teeth on the bottom, they left with the teeth on top in about an hour. Um, it was really nice to give someone a fixed opportunity. You see here, um, not a real deep overbite. I don't see a lot of parafunctional issues with this. And so we hooked it up on all three implants um, and it healed beautifully. It's been restored now for a few years and doing well. Um, so just a couple of cases that both show you extraction technique, implant placement, um, just to kind of, I guess, give a little substance and a little bit of reality to what we've been talking about the last little bit. And I think all of these things, immediate placement, immediate load, we teach classes in our institute on a regular basis that will help you. Nothing is better than a one-on-one -on -one mentoring session where you come to the institute uh, get a Utah license, very easy, about seven days, you can have a Utah license and come and help us uh, help you become the clinician that you dream of. And this, uh, Riley, beautiful cases, uh, appreciate your time. We know we're a little over. Uh, hope that you join us in our future webinars and classes that we teach. Love to show you the digital workflow that has us so revved up that has changed our uh, ability to meet our patients' needs with the DO uh, revolution of